Please uh, continue to enjoy your meal. I, uh, first of all, um, as you saw, prior to my mug being up there, we had uh, sponsors for the event, and I uh, want to thank the sponsors for supporting this event. And now I have the privilege of acknowledging a number of very special individuals, uh, donors to Tamist Endowment and the O'Donnell Endowment, who are in, in attendance with us tonight, who've helped create one of the really terrific organizations that this state has ever known. Uh, and I'd ask you to please stand to be acknowledged. Uh, and uh, three individuals, founders of the Tamist Endowment and O'Donnell uh, Endowment donors who are here are Tiffany Hartgraves Armstrong, Serena Rich, representing the O'Donnell Foundation, and Jeff Kodosky of National Instruments. Could you please stand and be acknowledged? We also have past TAMIS presidents, and I'd ask them to also stand. Tom Kasky, David Daniel, Lynn Draper, and Tinsley Oden. Please stand. You guys know that you're going to have to clear, clear the tables afterwards, right? We also have Industry and Community Aff Affiliates Committee. Uh, my good friend, Ernie Cockrell, please stand. Norbert Dietrich, Adam Hamilton, Robert Metcalf, and Kurt Swager, please stand. Thank you. And there is a special place in heaven for this next category, the presidents and chancellors. Please stand, my good friends and colleagues, David Callender, David Daniel, Brett Jouar, Bill Heinrich, Mark Hussey, Ted Mitchell, and Dwayne Nellis. Please stand. <laughs> David gets to stand up twice. And we're honored to be in the presence of uh, truly special individuals whose creativity has really changed science in a most fundamental way, our Nobel laureates, Robert Curl and Joan Dysonhofer. And we also have, as you'll see in your booklet, and I won't read out the names, uh, we have past O'Donnell Award recipients in attendance tonight. Uh, would you please stand and be acknowledged? This is a pretty, pretty awesome group because a number of them have gone on to get into the academies. Uh, I see that Beth Levine is over there. Beth, congratulations. Uh, and others. It's really been uh, terrific. Brandon Lee, others. This is really, uh, obviously, the committee knows how to pick winners. Uh, and now I'd like to introduce uh, Laureate Dysenhofer uh, to uh, make a few remarks and uh, continue with the awards program. Good evening. Um, I hope you enjoy your dinner. Um, I have uh, gotten the task to um, uh, preside over the, uh, the actual handing over of the awards. Um, I hope you all have uh, listened to the awardees, to their inspiring talks this afternoon. And uh, I would like to say a few words before I start with the awardees, uh, about uh, the Edith on Peter O'Donnell. And uh, their names are uh, everywhere uh, in Tamist, in uh, the research community, 
in education in Texas. And uh, I think we are uh, incredibly lucky to have people like this, like the two among us. And they combine uh, brilliant ideas, uh, unbelievable generosity, vision, uh, in a way that is totally unique. And I cannot really grasp how this all came about in two people who are uh, so modest as they, as Peter and Edith are. <clears throat> and um, as the name says, they were also instrumental in installing the uh, Edith and Peter O'Donnell Awards. And these awards are, uh, as uh, most of the project that the O'Donnells uh, pursued, they were aimed at uh, the future. So it was uh, made sure that the recipients are relatively young, um, that they uh, have been working in Texas for a while, um, that Thomas members uh, are excluded from being nominated, which I think is a very wise move, and uh, that, of course, uh, recipients of the O'Donnell Awards uh, are not prevented from becoming Thomas members uh, afterwards. And so <clears throat> the uh, award is, uh, um, of course, uh, honoring the recipients. It uh, uh, lifts them out of, uh, of uh, a relatively sort of unknown uh, existence of a research of research scientists and and uh, researchers in the industry, and presents them uh, to a broader public. And of course, it also uh, comes with uh, some benefits, like uh, a check over twenty five thousand dollars. And so, uh, <clears throat> it is. Uh, my pleasure to um, uh, announce the uh, video that is shown every year, traditionally, about 15 minutes video about uh, the work of these, of our four laureates uh, uh, in 2015. So please, uh, can the video be started? Every great discovery begins with an idea, a gut feeling that says maybe, just maybe, we can do things differently. It starts with an infectious passion that inspires future generations and lives on through the never-ending search for answers. Tonight, the Academy of Medicine, Engineering, and Science of Texas honors these four innovative researchers. These are the recipients of the 2015 Edith and Peter O'Donnell Awards. Thomas Trey Westbrook, Medicine. Worldwide, over a million women will develop invasive breast cancer every year. Last year, nearly 400,000 died from the disease. You have splicing data, you have uh, the BIOC data. So At Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Dr. Trey Westbrook and his team are using cutting edge technology to find genes that play a pivotal role in cancer. He helped develop a genome wide screening approach that identifies sensitivities in cancer cells. Through this technology, called RNAi screening, Trey has discovered that cancer cells have unique vulnerabilities. Exploiting this Achilles heel could lead to powerful treatments. What our laboratory has been focused on is trying to understand how a given cancer gene unveils a certain weakness for that cancer. And we've been uncovering those systematically uh, with the technologies we've developed uh, and then leveraging those into new therapeutic opportunities. Trey is particularly focused on triple negative breast cancer, any breast cancer that does not express the ER, PR, or HER2 genes. About 20% of breast cancers are triple negative and the outcomes are poor. 
My lab's been focused uh, really for the past seven or eight years now on trying to both understand what are the genes that are the culprits, the drivers of that disease, but also to unveil the weaknesses, the vulnerabilities of those cancers. Triple negative breast cancers are the most difficult to treat. Frankly, that's the area where we have the greatest need for under, understanding basic mechanisms as well as key targets. For Trey, the fight against cancer is personal. During a span of 18 months, while working on his postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard, his brother, mother, and father were each diagnosed with cancer. Trey's dad died less than two years later. I wish I had more time with my dad. I uh, wish I had received more of his mentorship as I got older in life, uh, but I think it set me on a path uh, that I've been um, very passionate about and maybe hopefully early enough to make a difference. When it touches you personally, it moves into really a mission that passes beyond just the professional. And, and I think that that very much adds to, to, to the, the passion with which he pursues his studies. There are encouraging signs of progress. Three of Trey's discoveries have led to therapies in development or in clinical trials. Also, breast cancer may not be the only cancer impacted by Trey's research. Many other cancers, including lung and prostate, could benefit from targeting cancer weak points. My mother is a great reminder that the clock's still ticking for other people. Uh, it gives us a lot of hope, uh, but certainly the, the, the victory is not ours yet, so we're still working on it. Haiyan Wang, engineering. The computers that we can hold in the palm of our hands today are a testament of the evolution of materials and technology. And Dr. Haiyan Wang is on the forefront of that evolution. In an effort to push those limits, she's applying her expertise in material science in new and exciting ways. From Stone Age to Bronze to, uh, to Iron Age, everything was driven by material discovery. We come into the new century, and it will be driven by new material discovery as well. Haiyan and her team at Texas A&M University are using nanotechnology to create more efficient materials and working to prove these materials could one day be used to make smaller, more effective fuel cells. A fuel cell, uh, for the sake of simplicity, uh, is like uh, an active battery, but it generates electricity rather than simply stores it. Our goal is to make the material so that the efficiency can be much higher and the operation temperature much lower. I see fuel cell electric vehicles that you don't have to plug into the wall. I really literally believe uh, that her fuel cell technology will transform transportation. Where much of conventional material science research has focused on developing the perfect material to gain the optimum results, Haiyan has taken a different approach. Instead, she and her team embrace the natural imperfections of a material and use nanotechnology to enhance the material's performance. If you can incorporate some smart and a unique nanostructure the defects, put them into the right spots, you can make a perfect material even better, actually. This revolutionary innovation has broad potential in electronic materials and devices, such as the development of more efficient superconductors that could transform the capabilities for practically anything that uses or transmits electricity. So high temperature superconductor has many um, potential applications because the superconductor means carry electricity without loss. It means the materials will be able to carry the electricity with zero conductance, or zero resistivity. Haiyan's work is an inspiration to her colleagues and peers in the field. But for her, inspiring her students each and every day is her number one priority. I will continue on my mature discovery efforts as well as my inspiration efforts. I will try to keep on inspiring new generations of mature scientists to join the workforce, to continue on the mature discovery, to make the world a better place to live. Chuk. Science. Uncovering knowledge is not just about asking the right questions, 
but being able to answer them. And for Dr. Yu Men Chuk, finding those answers starts by going back to the basics. At her lab at UT Southwestern, Yu Men has devoted much of her research to studying the fundamental processes of the human body, starting with the study of proteins and how they are transported in and out of the nucleus of the cell. We're working with proteins that are very temperamental, um, very difficult to work with. We have to kind of coax them biochemically to crystallize so that we can make enough to study their functions. When Yu Men and her team focused on one specific protein transporter, it led to a breakthrough discovery. This protein had this nuclear localization signal, and it just turned out that neurobiologists and neurologists had found that this protein was mutated in the familial form of ALS at that specific site. For patients suffering from ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, this could mean new and improved treatments thanks to a better understanding of this debilitating illness. If we hadn't done this work, the neuroscientists wouldn't have anything to connect to what the neurologists had found in terms of where the mutations are. So we provided the foundation for them to understand the mutations that they found in the patients. After making this discovery based on the way a protein is imported into the nucleus, Yu Men and her team decided to focus on an exporter protein that labs all over the world were already fiercely studying. CREM1 is best characterized nuclear exporter. And amongst the cargoes of CREM1 are um, proteins that are called tumor suppressors. In certain cancers, it's been found that the level of CREM1, this export protein, is very high. So inhibiting that process has become very important in, as a potential therapeutic target for slowing or inhibiting cancer growth. Instead of focusing her energy on the medicinal implications of CREM1, Yu Men and her team decided to go back to the basics and study the 3D structure of CREM1 to determine its basic functions. The discoveries led to the creation of a new and improved tumor suppressing drug by Yu Men's pharmaceutical collaborators at Carafarm. What her work has done is to enable a, for these pharmaceutical companies, and one in particular, to develop a drug that has less side effects, be well tolerated by patients, and have therapeutic benefit. Yu Men's work has shown a light on the importance of studying the fundamentals and has opened the door to dozens of other discoveries that could be made from focusing on the way proteins are transported in cells throughout the body. We have only studied one importer and one exporter. There are 20 of them in the family. They've got to be important, otherwise they wouldn't be around and they wouldn't have stuck around for that many years. If I'm gonna solve a problem, pick a problem, do something in my lab, it's got to be important and it's got to make a difference. Charles Collins, Technology Innovation. For centuries, doctors and scientists have been tasked with trying to diagnose illnesses. But finding out the root of a sickness can take days and even weeks. That means patient costs are higher and outcomes often aren't positive. So what kind of sample are you running? At Luminex Corporation in Austin, Dr. Charles Collins has invented technology that allows physicians to diagnose patients quicker and more accurately. Charles' invention, MagPix, allows doctors and scientists to run up to 4,800 individual tests in less than an hour. Our multiplexing technology brings together um, our beads and the ability to do lots of different targets all in the same assay. You often don't know why somebody is sick, and if you guess one at a time, it takes you forever to walk through all the different things that could be making them sick. So our technology enables us to bring all those answers in a single answer, single test, quickly. MagPix received FDA clearance and was launched commercially in 2010. A year later, it received the prestigious Medical Design Excellence Award. MagPix is now in diagnostic and research labs throughout the world. You'll hear examples of people who are using it for malaria testing you know, in Africa. They've actually taken the instruments out and out of main labs and been able to move it out more because of the robustness of, of the design. Ruggedness and reliability is important to the researcher or medical scientist in downtown Manhattan, and is just as important to the researcher in New Guinea or Sub-Saharan Africa.
Charles's invention is also being used to test for anthrax and other airborne threats. Charles's research on digital microfluidics has also resulted in a contract with the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. He is currently leading development of a handheld, field deployable diagnostic tool that can detect bioterrorism agents. Then you may be testing a soldier where you want to know, you know, maybe as a gastrointestinal, like what's causing the soldier to be sick? And that's the molecular panel. So you do this molecular test saying, well, what are all these markers that are making him sick? You may find C. diff and you say, okay, well, that's probably what's causing that diarrhea. And so you can, if you combine those two pieces of information together, then they can give a lot better profile of, of what's causing that soldier uh, to, be, to have problems and how is their body responding to it. Charles's contributions have advanced clinical diagnostics, healthcare, and scientific research. At Luminex, his MagPix technology has led to one spin-off product with another one in the works. Charles is just shy of 40, so expectations are high for even more discovery and invention. The single most important thing to Chuck is to set ego aside and to make sure that we advance medical science, we make the world a better place. He saves lives for a living and he takes that very seriously. We spend years developing the product, but uh, it's not until it gets out there into the market and people are doing these things with it that you really see like, oh yeah, that's what I was doing this for, was to get something out there that gave them the capability to save these people's lives. Congratulations to the 2015 recipients of the Edith and Peter O'Donnell Awards. And now we come to the actual prize ceremony. And <clears throat> the procedure is that um, uh, the uh, Award winners will uh, be introduced by the people who nominated them. So for that purpose, I uh, would like to come, uh, like to, the following people to come from to the stage, and that's Dr. Brandon Lee, uh, Dr. John Junkins, Dr. David Mangelsdorf, and Dr. Jeremy Bridge. <clears throat> so, let's take, take this. So the, the first uh, the first recipient is um, Thomas Westbrook. Could Thomas Westbrook come up to the stage, please? And he uh, will be introduced by Dr. Lee. Good evening. Uh, it's my great honor to uh, have this opportunity to introduce Dr. Trey Westbrook as the recipient of the 2015 O'Donnell Award in Medicine. Trey is currently the associate professor in the jointly appointed in the Department of Molecular and Human Genetics and Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at Baylor College of Medicine. Trey's life and career has been the product of a series of what I would call seminal binary sulfate decisions. He was born first in Tupelo, Mississippi, and grew up moving around because of his mom's career. And this first taught him, I think, the important principle of adaptability, an essential life lesson given his lifelong mission of fighting cancer. Now, in fact, along his journey, one such stop was here in Houston. Uh, he attended high school in Houston, in a local high school here. And it was here that, in fact, he made his first key binary sulfate decision. You see, Trey was a superb tennis player, something I aspired to. And he was, in fact, offered a scholarship to play Division I tennis at Vanderbilt, perhaps on his way to a professional career in tennis. Instead, he chose, though, to attend a small liberal arts college where he fell in love with biology and, in fact, left tennis behind. He then went on to pursue this love with his PhD studies at the University of Rochester. Again, underscoring, I think, his adaptability. In this case, to extreme weather from Houston 
to Rochester, New York. He initially actually enrolled in a dual PhD MBA program, perhaps thinking about the business world long term. And again, as the product of a binary self hate decision, and lucky for us, he chose to pursue his PhD primarily. There he worked with Dennis McCants and Hartman Land on a classical virology problem, primarily the role of human papillomavirus in cancer. And this was really his first engagement in his lifelong fight against cancer. After his PhD, Trey would coin what was his first purposeful act in science. He smartly chose to do his postdoctoral fellowship in the laboratory of Steve Elledge, who at the time was at Baylor College of Medicine, thinking he was in fact returning to Houston to learn about four genetic screens. As he says that he was perhaps tired of hypotheses-driven science. Um, of course, he ended up, in fact, helping Steve move boxes to Boston uh, because he shortly moved to Harvard uh, after Trey's arrival. In, irrespective of this, I think this was a marriage made in heaven because Trey was really the first researcher in Steve's lab focused on the cancer problem. And in, in fact, combining his virology background with uh, Steve's ability to do forward genetic screens, he engaged in what was considered a very high-risk project in Steve's lab. And in fact, I knew this as one of his previous graduate students was working on such a project, and I was on his thesis committee. This was, of course, the project which led to the seminal work which developed the first genome-wide large-scale RNAi screens in mammalian cells, combining the use of viral gene transfer and barcoded short hairpin RNAs. So with this superb background, in 2007, he uh, made another seminal binary self hate decision. He chose to join Baylor over UT Southwestern. <laughs> Excuse my friends at UT Southwestern. And at Baylor, Trey, obviously, as you saw from his superb talk, pioneered the use of these genetic tools to discover genes controlling cancer, in particular triple negative uh, breast cancer, and, and identified really these new concepts in this disease. For example, the coordinated kinase dysregulation he talked about, and then the very exciting work, which is still unpublished, but uh, I think another novel concept of the spliceosome in, in cancer's uh, uh, susceptibility. So in short, we are delighted that Trey chose to return to Texas to apply his innovative genetic tools in the fight against cancer. I would end by saying that, unfortunately, I cannot tell you about his most important and interesting binary self hate decision, and that is how he met his wife, Casey, and had two wonderful children. You'll have to ask, that him, ask him that yourself. I promised him I would not divulge that. <laughs> Please join me in congratulating Trey Wesco for this year's O'Donnell Prize in Medicine. Next is the. Uh, I think I just a oh. <laughs> sorry about that. No, sorry about that. <laughs> it's not every day you get to two step with someone of such notoriety. So that's. Uh, um, uh, well, after that, Brendan, I'm not sure what to say here, uh, but wow, this is uh, a bit of an overwhelming moment for me. Um, I'd like to start by uh, thanking Edith and Peter O'Donnell. Of course, it's their passion for both research and education uh, in the great state of Texas that uh, makes this possible, and of course, their foundation and um, all those here representing them. Uh, I'd like to thank, of course, the committee for their hard work. Um, in a <clears throat> state full of such rich science and medicine, uh, I know the decisions are very hard, and so I'm, I'm humbled and, and very thankful for, uh, for their recognition. Um, oftentimes, these sort of individual recognitions are really more about, uh, or 
more about those around you. And I can honestly say that uh, being in a place as um, nurturing and as um, sometimes provoking as, as Baylor has been uh, really good for us. Um, so there's a few members, uh, in any good environment, there's always a few members that stand out and that make a special impact on you, and I'd like to uh, mention a few of them. Um, Adam Cuspa and Art Baudet, I'm not sure if they're still here, uh, but they initially recruited me here uh, to Baylor and um, did everything I think humanly possible to nurture a fledgling new research program into something that uh, hopefully matters. So uh, very thankful to them. Um, I'm also thankful to uh, Brendan uh, and to uh, Ted Wenzel, who have now sort of taken their reins uh, as department leadership, uh, and I think are really following a tradition of trying to bring up young people uh, and teach them how to both be innovators, but also to be good mentors themselves. Um, many other senior people at Baylor, uh, Baylor has a long-standing tradition, I think, of the senior people really caring about uh, junior scientists and people uh, who are trying to grow up in the, in the scientific community. Huda Zogby, uh, Jeff Rosen, Ken Osborne, uh, members of the Breast Center that you heard me mention. Um, I'm a basic biologist and a geneticist, so uh, trying to do something that really matters in the, in the cancer world. You heard, I think, a, a pervasive theme in all the talks today that it takes team toward team-oriented science. Um, certainly thankful to them. Um, and of course, I need to thank uh, the very rich and innovative people in my lab. Uh, they uh, make it a real joy and a, and a passion for me to come do science every day. And uh, it's really their work that was on display today and their creativity and their uh, passion. Um, I obviously, as you saw from the video, I would like to thank my family for their passion and uh, for their inspiration. Uh, my children, who definitely inspire me uh, daily uh, and remind me that science is, is fun. Um, and uh, finally, um, oh, this is harder than I thought. Um, I'd like to thank my wife, Casey, uh, who, uh, when you're on this sort of journey, um, she's certainly made uh, almost indescribable sacrifices so that, uh, so that I could be here talking with you tonight. Uh, finally, I want to thank you for uh, your participation and your really contributions to the scientific community, and there's so many leaders here, so many uh, thoughtful and forward-thinking people um, that are people I aspire to, to be like. And with that, I, I thank you for your attention, and um, thank you again. Thank you, Tom, and thank you especially for uh, preventing me from Screwing up completely. <laughs> so, try again. Our next uh, recipient is the uh, uh, award in uh, uh, engineering. And the uh, recipient, Haiyan Wang, will be introduced by Dr. Chunkins. Thank you, Hans. Thirteen years ago, Haiyan Wang was a graduate student at uh, NC State uh, studying material science. And there was a gathering uh, at the invitation of uh, Senator uh, Hutchinson <coughs> of about 15 people. Uh, Myself, Bob Curl, and uh, Kasky, and several others in the audience uh, were present at that meeting. And this was the birth of, uh, of uh, TAMIST, it proved to be the birth of TAMIST. When we envisioned the, what became the O'Donnell Awards of, in, of trying to recognize and reward uh, the rising stars uh, in Texas, our mental simulation uh, was off significantly. Many times in life, anticipation of something magical exceeds the realization. Not so in the case of the Adal Awards. <clears throat> Hyun Wang is full professor uh, of electrical engineering and computer engineering at uh, Texas A&M. Uh, following finishing her PhD uh, at uh, UNC, she went to the Los Alamos uh, National Laboratory where she joined a uh, 
really, I think, the elite uh, superconductivity uh, uh, research uh, team in the nation. And there, uh, she put to use some things she learned in uh, graduate school. If you're not a material science, you may have to go to your uh, thesaurus to find out what epitaxy means. Uh, it is, uh, uh, it's really the art science of how to do nanostructure uh, at, the, uh, at the atomic and molecular scale in order to design materials. Uh, and she is the embodiment, uh, her career is, of how to take that uh, fundamental uh, set of processes and engineer materials to realize properties that could only be dreamed of uh, a few years ago. Following her time at Lawrence Livermore, during which time she went from being a postdoc and uh, two years and change to being a member of the technical staff, uh, that's no small feat uh, at, uh, at Lawrence Livermore. Uh, we had the good fortune uh, in her third year to recruit her in 2006 to come uh, to Texas uh, A&M as a member uh, of our computer engineering and uh, our electrical engineering and computer engineering department, and she also took a joint appointment in material science and engineering. Hai and Wang is hard to put a label on. She's a scientist, she's an engineer, uh, she's an inventor, uh, and she knows how to do real world design at the, at the macro level that starts at the nano level. <laughs> she has tremendous number of transitions uh, toward applications uh, of her technology, including work in fuel cells uh, that if you saw the day's lecture, uh, you saw that she was able to achieve uh, what I would consider a world record, a reduction in the peak temperature uh, of a, of a uh, solid oxide fuel cell uh, while simultaneously uh, getting a 3x improvement in performance. Uh, I hope uh, we have some venture capitalists in the room uh, because this is very, very important uh, advance. <laughs> She's uh, a, an expert in the area of uh, thin films uh, where she can engineer the uh, ferro ferromagnetic and ferroelectric properties of materials. And, uh, and as I mentioned, she's an expert in, in superconductivity. She's still in her 30s. She has over 300 journal articles and a resume that would choke a horse. <laughs> she's a fellow of the American Society of Metals International. I believe she's one of the few people I've ever heard of that has four career awards. She won the Presidential Early, uh, uh, Early Career Award. Uh, she won the NSF Early Career Award, the AFOSR Early Career Award, and the ONR Early Career Award. And I'm tonight convey conveying the John Junkins Early Career Award. <laughs> She's also uh, playing a part-time role as a program manager at NSF and managing a $20 million research budget. She's also a a busy mother, and she has three beautiful children at home, and her husband is also a member of the Texas A&M faculty. Please make welcome the incomparable Hyann Wayne. I cannot express how much appreciation I have to all of you. Actually, I do want to say a few words uh, before you let me off the stage. The first thing I want to thank uh, is thanks Temis. Thanks Temis for giving us this great opportunity to present our work and research in front of the, the best brain, our smartest brain in Texas, and giving us the opportunity to develop us career following all of your past, your successful stories. Second, I want to thank Dr. John Junkin. Uh, how are you? I, actually, he introduced me to Tamas and told me about the story about Tamas and O'Donnell Awards. So actually, it's his 
persistency, I mean, convinced me I will keep going and to try the Odong Awards for three times. And actually, I, I very much appreciate his mentorship and encouragement in the past few years. And I also want to thank Texas A&M, who provided the foundation for all of my research since 2006. And many of our deans and even my former department has cost us, and now a uh, research dean and many of the research deans and the VPR office, um, they are the greatest supporter to my research and which provide all the facility I need. As you can see, I'm research intensive. A lot of research equipments and facilities are needed. I also want to thank my team members and my former colleagues who we work as a team. It's never being down by one person. It's a team effort and I very much appreciate all of their help and support. And I also want to thank Texas. Texas, I'm so proud to be part of Texas. I feel very lucky to be part of it. It's a state with enormous potential for development. And uh, I feel very proud to be a faculty in Texas A&M and continue to teach in Texas. The last but not least, I want to thank my husband, Xin Hong Zhang, who is also a faculty in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at Texas A&M. And it's him 15 years ago encouraged me to, to come and join him for study abroad uh, in, in the US and started to achieve high uh, way beyond what I have imagined many, many years ago. And with that, I want to thank you all for the great honor and very much appreciate. Enjoy your nights. Yeah, thank you. The next uh, awardee uh, receives the, uh, the award in science, and I uh, ask Dr. David Manglesdorf to introduce our very own Yumin Chuk. So in recognizing the impact of our next awardee's accomplishments, I want you to imagine first trying to figure out the design of a traffic system that is so complicated that it accurately transports 1,000 or more pieces of cargo back and forth through a secure barrier without misplacing or damaging any of that cargo or clogging up the doors that that cargo has to enter or exit in order to traverse through that secure barrier. Now, to give you an idea of what the complexity of such a system might look like, I want you to recall that just over 20 years ago, the city of Denver tried to implement such a system and it was an utter failure. That was the much aligned automated luggage baggage system that was run by over 100 computers and was supposed to transfer 3,500 pieces of luggage a day at the brand new Denver International Airport. Some of you may have lost your luggage there. <laughs> the system cost tens of millions of dollars, led to bankruptcy of an airline, and had to be abandoned because, of course, it didn't work. If we would have done it in Texas, it would have worked. <laughs> <laughs> in contrast, the transport system I'm talking about works effortlessly every day, 24-7, in the millions of cells that inhabit your body. It is responsible for the accurate transport of proteins through the membrane barrier of the nucleus by way of a channel, which you heard earlier, is called the nuclear pore complex. That complex enables proteins to travel back and forth between the cytoplasm and the nucleus of the cell. And by controlling this traffic, the complex plays a fundamental role in the physiology of every eukaryotic cell. And tonight, we honor the person who figured out the key components of how this complex works. She discovered the signals or codes that many of the proteins use to get in and out of the nucleus. She also discovered the, identified the defects in the transport mechanism that lead to those debilitating diseases we heard of. And she used this information to help guide the development of new classes of drugs that may one day be used to fight diseases like cancer, AIDS, and even the common flu. And 
She did all of that while juggling the demands of raising a family, keeping a famous husband in check as well, including two wonderful boys that are sitting here today. That's pretty noteworthy accomplishment for one of Texas' new scientific rock stars, whom I'd like to introduce tonight as the winner of the 2015 Edith and Peter O'Donnell Award in Science, Dr. Yumin Shu. two minutes at the podium, and I have many people to thank. So I'll make this as brief as I can. Um, first of all, I would thank, like to thank Tamas uh, for choosing me for um, this uh, award. Um, it was quite an unexpected, and I am absolutely thrilled. And uh, Tamas for establishing this award, and it is in Peter O'Donnell, of course. And then I would like to thank um, my chair and nominee, uh, Devo. Um, for his support for all these years, um, for mentoring me and for bailing me out in some financially tough years. Uh, much appreciated. And also to, uh, thanks to both Devo and Al Gilman for recruiting my husband and I from New York City to Texas. That was no easy feat. Um, and um, then I would like to thank my colleagues in the departments of pharmacology and biophysics, um, and also the structural biology community at UT Southwestern, um, which is and just an amazing community of colleagues, and especially to Hans for having um, built the protein crystallography infrastructure um, that enables us to do our work um, with ease, actually, in terms of synchrotron trips and also in-house um, facilities. Um, I would like to thank my collaborators and colleagues for their friendship and for their mentoring and for working together. Um, these are colleagues um, outside of, of biophysics and pharmacology, such as my colleagues in cell biology and in biochemistry and also in physiology. Um, and of course, my collaborators uh, na nationally and internationally that I've mentioned uh, earlier in the afternoon. And then I would like to thank my family. I have a very large, very loving, and very supportive family. Many of them, uh, some of them have traveled here from far. My sisters traveled here from Malaysia. My mother-in-law, Lois, traveled here from Michigan. And Aunt Carol and Uncle Lenny are here from Philadelphia. So I'm truly very well loved. <laughs> and, so, um, and then I would like to thank my boys, Samuel and Saul, for tolerating and even enjoying and encouraging those lengthy scientific conversations that their father and I have at home. And last but not least, I would like to thank my husband, Mike Rosen, um, for his love and support. He's always there to share in the excitement and the disappointments, and he is my strongest cheerleader. So thank you, and thank you for your attention. Last but not least, uh, the award in technological innovation. Um, Dr. Jeremy Bridge Cook will introduce Charles Collins. Evening, everyone. So I'm uh, really very pleased to have the honor to introduce. Dr. Chuck Collins as the final award recipient for tonight. <clears throat> Chuck received his BSc from Trinity University and his PhD in solid state electronics from the University of Texas. After his PhD, Chuck joined the US Army Research Laboratory where he obtained three patents for his work on ultraviolet LEDs. 
Chuck joined Luminex in 2006 as a member of the company's advanced technology group. At Luminex, Chuck quickly distinguished himself as an inventor and a leader in the systems group. The company was trying to find a way to increase the reliability and decrease the cost of our instruments to our customers. <clears throat> with these two guiding principles, Chuck proceeded to invent, along with his team, an entirely new way to analyze our color-coded microspheres, one which did indeed lower costs significantly and improve reliability and ruggedness. Chuck's inventions were ultimately developed by him and his team into an instrument called MagPix. The success of the instrument is demonstrated in part by the fact that Luminex has sold almost 2,000 of them in only a few years since launch. More importantly, hundreds of scientific discoveries have been published with the help of the MagPix instrument, and many thousands of patients have been accurately diagnosed using the MagPix MagPix instrument that Chuck invented. As you may have heard <clears throat> from Chuck's talk this afternoon, this one remarkable invention has been used to diagnose cholera patients in the epidemic in Haiti, has been used to study malaria in Papua New Guinea, to diagnose E. coli 0157 patients in Germany, and to diagnose Ebola patients in the terrible outbreak still going on today in Western Africa, amongst many other things that it's been used for. It truly is a remarkable technology innovation. In addition to hearing about some of what Chuck has done, though, I want to tell you a little bit about who he is. Chuck is an incredibly fast learner with an inquisitive mind that always seeks to understand how and why things work. Chuck is a natural leader who pulls people together and inspires them to work as hard as they possibly can to achieve common goals. Chuck is a dedicated father and husband. And finally, Chuck is a person who I'm very proud to be able to call a friend. So it's my distinct honor to introduce this year's winner of the O'Donnell Award for Technology Innovation, Dr. Chuck Collins. You don't need my iPad, do you? No, it's okay. Yeah, okay. And I got the standing in the middle correct this time. So. so thank you, Jeremy, for your kind remarks. I really appreciate it. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the TAMIST organization for putting on such a great conference. Um, you know, there's been so many great talks to hear and things that just spur so many ideas about uh, how all this stuff works. So I really appreciate it. Um, I'm honored to be um, awarded. Um, this award by the, by the TAMAS organization. Um, I'd like to thank my colleagues at Luminex. Um, there's, you know, the instruments we develop really have, require, a, you know, dis disciplines across engineering and science. And as you've heard from many others this evening, it takes a team of these cross-discipline uh, people to work hard uh, on these technological challenges, come together, and really take these products to market. So I'm really appreciative of all the hard work of the people I work with at Luminex. I'd also like to thank my uh, parents, my father Gary and my mother Carol here this evening. Uh, thank you for pushing me and providing for my education. Um, it's really meant a lot to me. And finally, I'd like to thank my wife Connie. Um, you know, work can take a lot of time uh, of our lives and I really appreciate your continued support uh, of my career. So, thank you all. Now that was pretty terrific. Uh, so the awardees should stick around. We have to do a group photo. Actually, next year, 2016, will mark the uh, 10th anniversary of this uh, coveted award. And uh, please. Come next year, it'll be a really terrific, terrific celebration. So just a few quick announcements.
There will be an after-dinner reception in Palm Court. The staff will escort uh, us to the location. Uh, breakfast is at 7.15 to 8.15, and then we start promptly at 8.30 with our keynote speaker, uh, Fred De Sauvage from Genentech. And you're in for quite a treat. Fred has got some spectacular work uh, that he'll talk to us about. So I just want to thank everybody for taking part in this truly special awards uh, dinner. Uh, we'll uh, see you tomorrow. Have a good night. Ten years have passed since the effort began, identifying those Texans working among us who exceeded our wildest expectations. Their work leads us down a path of discovery. Their breakthroughs bring us closer to a cure. Their innovations allow us to dream bigger, broader. Ten years ago, we began celebrating their accomplishments, recognizing their remarkable efforts. And now, coming in January 2016, the most prestigious award for recognizing achievements by Texas-based researchers marks its 10th anniversary. 10 years of recognizing the most excellent among us. 40 recipients in medicine, engineering, science and technology innovation, and five Texas innovators who have been elected to the National Academies. The Edith and Peter O'Donnell Awards 10th Anniversary.